Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to another video on this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. In the previous video, we took a look at vectors, as we took a look at the algebra behind vectors, and we could already see how they were super interesting for basic uh, orientation and translation operations, right? However, in this video, I would like to take a closer look at other geometry entity that is very common in a lot of the 3D modeling environments that I work with, which is going to be planes. And planes are extremely useful when it comes to orienting and locating three-dimensional things in space. And it is so because planes are actually an aggregate of three different things. A plane is made up of a center point. So the plane has an origin, it has a center, and that center is located somewhere in three-dimensional space. And then it has two vectors. It has a main vector in the x direction that is pointing to what is the main orientation of that plane. And it has another vector called typically the y vector of the plane, which is pointing to the secondary direction of that plane, all right? And uh, what happens is that the aggregation of these three entities, a point marking the center, the origin of a plane, and then two x and y vectors, local x and y vectors, um, defining the orientation of that plane in three-dimensional space, what those three objects together do is that they form a two-dimensional plane that can have any orientation and any origin in the in world coordinates. And that is extremely, extremely useful to define uh, orientation of things or targets of things or how to orient things in 3D space or for robotics, for example, is they're super, super useful to define a target for a particular motion operation. So they're super, super useful. Now, I would like to say that the way planes are treated in different software environments is different. Some software environments have planes that don't really have a center because they're closer to mathematical planes, which is a completely different story. Whereas other environments do have planes that have a center. And sometimes those are referred to as frames. So frames and planes are kind of interchangeable terms that you will find in different environments or different, different software packages. And in the case of Grasshopper, planes have a center, they have two main vectors, and those vectors have very particular properties. Those properties are that the x vector is typically an unit vector in any direction, and the y vector is also a, a, a unit direction, and, and uh, it's also, sorry, it's also a unit vector uh, so both are unit vectors. And another thing that is mandatory in the case of Grasshopper is that the two vectors have a, the two vectors are perpendicular to each other. They are orthogonal. Or in another, or, or saying it in a different way, they form 90 degrees between each other. So if you think about this, this particular, um, this particular convention what it means is that the two vectors form an, an orthonormal coordinate system. What that means is that the two vectors, because they're unit and they're perpendicular, they're actually very, very similar to the vectors that we use to represent the world coordinate. And therefore, this plane could be considered a local coordinate system. And it can be considered a local coordinate system also because if the two vectors are unit and they form 90 degrees between each other, then we can actually infer, we can actually deduce, doing a little bit of vector algebra, we could find a third piece of information for this plane, which is a perpendicular, a normal vector to that plane, which is typically referred to as the C vector. And if we represent it as a unit vector, then those three vectors together can represent a local coordinate system. Local coordinate systems are extremely useful. I can't even start describing like uh, all the different ways we can use them. And in, if you ask me, for me, they are the MVP, the most valuable players when it comes to doing serious computational geometry. 
So we're going to see a lot of applications of this and very soon I will try to start discouraging you from using simple points or simple vectors in general and just stick to using planes um, as a general rule of thumb, as a general good practice. Okay, And that is because planes, since at the end of the day, they are defined by a center and two vectors, they're basically nine numbers. That's what's important about them. And with nine numbers, that is something super lightweight for the computer to, to, to process, we can actually get a lot of information and a lot of utility from it. So let's take a look in Grasshopper how planes are handled and how we can operate and how we can use them in different ways. Let's start. So as I said in my previous video, I believe, um, planes and all the components that relate to plane generation and plane manipulation are also inside of the vector tab. The vector tab has basically everything that is cool in Grasshopper. So if we go to the plane category, you can see that there's a lot of different ways of creating planes, creating planes and modifying planes. So for example, the most canonical planes or the some of the most useful one will be the XY plane. The XY plane is a plane that starts uh, that is typically center on the origin on zero zero and has the orientation of the X and Y. So basically, it's a plane that has the same orientation as the world coordinate. And if I turn the world coordinate off, you can if I turn the world grid off, you can see that the visualization in Grasshopper is this tiny grid, this tiny four by four grid, this tiny point here marking the center and then a thicker red line marking the x direction and a thicker green line marking the green direct the, the y direction. The z the C direction is not showcased in the preview because it's implicit, because we can imagine the Z vector sticking out of here. I can also do, for example, a Y, Z plane. So for example, that will be a vector that will have its X, local X coordinate pointing in the Y direction and its local Y coordinate pointing in the C direction sorry, the axis, the local X axis pointing in the Y direction and the local Y axis pointing in the Z direction. And if I turn that off, I can also use an X C plane. An X C plane will be a plane where the plane's X axis is pointing in the global X direction and the plane's Y axis is pointing in the Z direction. You can see that these three planes together kind of form this sort of, um, this sort of, I don't know, uh, triplet of planes that define Cartesian space, if you will. Now, why are planes useful? Well, planes are useful because basically every component in Grasshopper that generates geometry, it doesn't ask you for a plane, sorry, for a point. It asks you for a plane because planes can represent orientation in 3D space. And we have seen this in previous examples. So for example, if I go to curves and primitives, if I drop in an ellipse that can be defined by two radii, right? So the what the ellipse is asking me is a base plane, because depending on the plane that I will give it, for example, and let's say that X is going to be this and Y is going to be this, right? Depending on which Orient which plane do I give it, then the ellipse is going to be in, in XY, is going to be in YZ, or it's going to be in XZ, as you can see here, right? So if I now wanted to create, for example, the, um, the basic shape of an ellipsoid, I could do something like this. I could create a, an ellipsoid with some kind of X and Y radii here. And then I could create another ellipse in the Y and C plane. And then the X direction of the ellipse has to be the Y value. So that's going to be this one. And then the Y direction has to be the C value. So this way I am creating, okay. And then you can see how the two ellipses are now matching here in the kinks in, the, in these intersections. And then for the XC plane, I can drop another ellipse. And then the X direction 
is going to be the x value here and then the c the y direction is going to be the c value here and you can see how now these three are kind of could be the generative lines for an ellipsoid so this kind of like bean shape uh, object in 3d all right uh, this is by combining ellipses in three different orientations in 3d space now planes can also be just created from scratch they can be created from their all their original components so if i choose to construct a plane from scratch then what the component is going to ask me is for the origin of the plane as a point it's going to ask me for an x direction as a vector and a y direction as a vector i could create uh, i could construct a point and i could construct two vectors with like nine sliders etc but it's a little tedious so i'm just going to take a little bit of a shortcut so i'm going to drop here three points I'm going to bring them into Grasshopper. So I'm going to set one point here at the center, the first one, and then I'm going to copy and paste this three times. The second one is going to be this one, and the third one is going to be this one here. All right? And then what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use this point for the origin. Okay, so I'm just going to plug it in here. And by default, it's giving me a plane that is oriented in the X and Y orientation with the center here. I'm going to move this a little bit up in C so that we can see like volumetrically this, this plane having some kind of orientation, all right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of numerically generating X and Y, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two vectors from this point to this point and another one from this point to this point. And then I'm going to use those two vectors to fit them into constructing the plane. How am I going to do that? We know this from the previous video. I can create a vector between two points. So that's going to be vector between the start, the origin point and the first direction point, and another vector between the origin point and the second orientation point. If I wanted to visualize those, I could do something like this, where I could display from this anchor this vector, and I could display from that anchor the other vector. So I have those two vectors, which are the vectors that I want to use to align the plane. So now I just fit the first orientation vector. I fit it as the X vector and I take the second orientation. And, but you see that, so now it is working. X is aligned with this vector, but you can see that this other vector is off plane. So I can plug in the second vector. And now you can see that the plane is contained in the plane is containing the second vector. But wait, Jose, whoa, this was very strange. You told us that vectors for planes have to be unit and have to be perpendicular to each other. They have to be form 90 degrees between them. And these two vectors are clearly longer than one unit. One unit is this, sorry, one unit is this, and they clearly don't form 90 degrees. They form something like, what is, what is that, 70? So how could this happen? Well, it turns out that this component here is very smart. And what it does is it forms a plane with whatever. It forms the best plane that fits the information that it was given. For the origin, it can take it as it is. But if you give it an X vector that is longer than unit or shorter, it will, re, it will resize it to create a vector, to create a vector that is unit. That's one thing. And for the third vector, if it is not perfectly at 90 degrees, what it will do, it, it will use that second vector to just orient the plane so that it tries to fit that secondary direction as good as possible, but always respecting the 90 degree angles and the unit vector. So that's why this second vector is not aligned with this one, but the plane at least is containing the two vectors. So, <clears throat> what we just did here and the numerical and the numbers of why, how it's done um, <clears throat> are perhaps a more advanced topic. Uh, you can check my GSD videos if you want to learn more about, about that or you can check some geometry gems. I think we've done some geometry gems um, to see that. But you can see that the plane is now represented with the X, Y, C of the center and here numerically it with the C vector. 
All right. Okay. So what we have done here is implicitly create a point, create a plane by finding the two vectors for direction and using the origin. So basically what we've done is create a plane using three points. Well, it turns out that in Grasshopper, there is a component that directly, without needing to find the intermediate vectors and blah, 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 it already gives us a plane using three points. The main point is going to be the origin. So that's going to be, I'm going to turn this off and this off so that it's clear what I'm doing. The first point is the origin. The second point is the orientation of the X. And the third point is the orientation of Y. And if I do that, you can see that this plane is identical to the one that we manually generated. So this, in a way, is a shortcut. And are they identical? Let me plug it in here. Yes, they are pretty much identical. So this form here is like a manual way of creating planes where from three points where this was basically using a shortcut, using a component that does that, does that automatically for us. Now, of course, we're not even close to being done here because now is when the cool stuff start. So remember in my previous video when we were doing vectors, we discussed how we could divide a curve into a series of points and the component gave us additionally, as a bonus, it gave us the perpendicular, sorry, the tangent direction at the curve on those points. So very similarly, we can find, for example, for a curve, we can find planes that define the orientation of that curve at each one of those uh, division points. So for example, if I have a curve that is on Rhino and then I bring it into Grasshopper, then something that I can do is I can go to curve and I can go to division and then I can divide a curve in a set of frames that are perpendicular to that curve along the curve. So if I do that, I can say now I can divide that curve and you can see all those planes. And then I can, for example, I can make, oh, sorry, um, no, this should be an integer. So I can say I can subdivide in 20 amounts of points. And this is something that is going to happen very often. Sometimes the size of the planes, how they are rendered inside of Grasshopper, it's a little too big or sometimes it's a little too small. So something you may want to play with is going to view, sorry, going to display preview plane size. Here you can change the size of how big uh, planes show up on your screen. So for example, I'm going to reduce it to number two and you can see that now the planes are much smaller and you can see how super, super cool each one of these planes is now defining perpendicularity to the curve along it's a, it's it's along it's twisting right and you can see the x and the y directions of the of the of the plane so this can be really useful for example now to for, to draw ellipses that are oriented there and for example these um, these are going to be the x and the y right and you can see how for example i can have one dimension that is really dominant over the other. And then you can see how the these ellipses are now oriented according to the perpendicularity of the curve. So if we wanted to, for example, create an extrusion of a profile across this curve, we could just say, let's create a loft, for example, Let's create a loft that is going through all these curves that I have generated. And then I can have this elliptical section kind of pipe that is going through all those perpendicular frames that I just created. And what's interesting also is that the orientation of these planes uses the tangency uh, and the curvature of the curve as the main directions. This is what's called binomial planes. I forget binomial, my focal binomial. I think it's called binomial planes. Let me double check that. I don't want to lie to you. Yes, sorry, I was actually lying to you. <laughs> I brought binomial because I was doing, I was recently starting up, but it's not the binomial plane. It's called the osculating plane. 
It's a plane that is formed by the tangent vector as the main direction and is formed by the um, by the by the um, by the radius of curvature at that point on the curve. Uh, so that's that's what is happening here. And uh, so the C is the um, C is the um, is the tangent and uh, X is the is the center of curvature is pointing towards the center of curvature in this in this curve. This was unnecessary information, but um, still cool though. But yes, so we can use this, for example, to orient geometry to orient curves on top of other curves, according to perpendicularity and according to tangency. But this, of course, is not reduced to curves only, it's also applicable to surfaces. So for example, let's say that um, I have a surface in Rhino that I bring into Grasshopper. And what I want to do is I want to now populate on top of this surface a bunch of geometry. And hopefully what I want to do is I want to make sure that the geometry is respecting or is oriented somehow according to the curvature of the surface. So what we have learned in the previous ex exercises is that I can subdivide a surface in a bunch of points, for example. And if I press here, if I add here a couple of UV parameters, I can subdivide this surface into a collection of U and V points. And then let's say that I wanted to use those points as the center to place cubes and those cubes be oriented towards the, the surface. The way I would do that is, for example, I would go now to primitives, I would go to center box, and I would create a box that is centered on a plane. Ha ha ha. So you can see that the input for this component, for this box, is going to be a base plane. However, I don't really have base planes. The only thing that I have here is division points. So I can still plug it in here. And actually, this is a little too big. So let me let me reduce the size of these elements. So x and y and c. So I'm just going to make those smaller. Okay. So now you can see that these cubes are kind of showing up there. But first of all, they're not oriented along the surface. But also, what happened here is that I had points as geometry that I plugged into a plane input. Why does that even work? Well, it works because since planes and points are kind of very affine, very similar types of entities, you can think of points as a dumber or a simpler kind of entity than a plane. A plane has so much more information. It has a point, which is the origin, but then it also has two direction vectors, whereas the, plane, the point is just the location in space. So what Grasshopper does in this case is that whenever you give any input, you give it a geometry type that is simpler than the geometry type that it can actually take, then what it does is it adds on top of the missing information some default information. In this case, what is happening here is that to the points, this component takes those points as the origin of the planes that is going to be using to orient these cubes. But it gives those planes default x and y directions in the x and y world coordinates. And that's why all these boxes are actually oriented in the x and y coordinates of the world. Now, this is not really cool. So what I would like to do is I would like to make sure that this these boxes are oriented along the surface. So maybe I could do some operations with the normal vectors and play around with that and see if I could create planes that respect that orientation. But actually, I'm going to save us a little bit of that, uh, in that processing. Actually, if I go to utils, you can see that the device surface component, this one, is right next to another one that is called surface frames which says that it generates a grid of UB frames, so UB planes, on top of a surface. So this component is basically the exact same thing. It's just that instead of giving us 
points and normals, it gives us planes. So I'm just going to plug in here and in here and in here. I'm going to make this surface like I'm going to scale it by a factor of three. Uh, so, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to scale it. Uh, this surface base point is going to be zero, zero, zero. And then the factor is going to be three. Okay, so now much bigger. You can see that the planes that I'm getting from that subdivision are actually aligned very nicely with the surface. So now if I use those planes to orient these cubes, now the cubes are not going to be aligned with x, y, I'm going to be aligned with the surface now. So you can see how nice these cubes are respecting the orientation of the surface. They are really nicely aligned. And if I actually play a little bit with this, if I wanted to extrude them farther in the x in the x direction, I could I could overlap, I could change the x, and you could see how now they are creating this super nice form sticking out perpendicularly from the surface. This is really, really useful for a lot of operations. You see how nice this is? Uh -huh. So this is why, for example, I have stopped using divide surfaces like in forever. Because like, if I can generate more and better information, why not? Right? Because like, this is similar to what I was saying from when I was talking about grafting, flattening, and I said that as much as you can, try to use graft so that you always stay at a higher level of information and you have as much information as possible. If your computer is not lagging, etc., etc., if you can keep up with that. But if you have planes, planes contain points inside of them, but they also give you orientation. They also give you the two vectors. So why would you want to work with points only if you can work with planes and at any time just extract the point if you only need that point uh, and cut away the information? All right, so it's the same principle. So this is how to use planes um, to orient, for example, geometry on top of a surface. All right, so bottom line, this is what I wanted to say about planes. It's going to, um, again, I would like to do some hands-on exercise to practice and to see how they can be useful in other scenarios. But long story short, Planes are one of my favorite entities when it comes to working in 3D. They have like a lot of information. They're super useful. They keep orientation. It's great. It's for me, they are the MVP and they're super cool. So I would recommend that as much as you can, you work with 3D planes as the basis of your geometry generation and manipulation for the reasons that I just explained here and for other reasons that we will see very soon farther down in this sequence of videos. All right. So... Um, until then, this was Jose Luis, this was Planes, this was Intro to Parametric Modeling. Thanks a lot. Um, if you like what you saw, maybe consider subscribing to this channel, liking this video, turning on notifications, and all those things. And I'm going, I will see you on the next video, where I think I'm going to be talking about numerical series. All right, let's take a look at that. See you on the next video. Thank you.